The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Beloved, please turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Here ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Well, I do bring you warm greetings from Christ Church Presbyterian in Charleston, South Carolina. It's wonderful to be back here in Greenville and particularly at uh, Woodruff Road Presbyterian Church as Woodruff Road was one of our uh, main supporting churches. In fact, uh, one of the very first meetings uh, that I had to discuss the idea of Christ Church Presbyterian took place in Pastor Robin's office just across the parking lot. What's extraordinary is uh, with uh, some prayer, uh, with some planning, with a little vision, uh, the Lord can do some extraordinary things when we trust him. Amen? And so Christ Church was just an idea nine years ago, and now it is a growing, healthy church in the low country, and we give all praise to the Lord uh, for that. We need more church plants. Uh, We need more church planting to take place because that is the mission of the church, to plant church, to plant churches and to do so with the means of grace, and to strengthen those churches, and then to go do it again uh, elsewhere, both here in America and around the world. I also want to give praise to God for this seminary. I'm so thankful for the invitation uh, by uh, my friend Jonathan Master, and I'm so excited about what the Lord is doing here at uh, Greenville Presbyterian Theological uh, Seminary. I give thanks to God for uh, what is happening here. I also want to say that uh, before I begin my my message, um, the theme for this year is quite appropriate. The theme for this year is quite appropriate, light in the darkness. Uh, What uh, was said earlier uh, in the earlier lecture was was spot on. Uh, We are exiles, we are pilgrims, and yet we are called to be light in the darkness. We are not called to retreat but we are called to go forward. The armor of God is that which protects the front of us, and we move forward uh, as we contend for the faith and as we are God's uh, bright, uh, confident, not confident in ourselves, but in, in Christ and in the means of grace. We are his confident soldiers that are moving forward, and we're trusting the Lord, and we are confident in this day of trial. Think of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, who calls himself a servant of the gospel of God, who says, I am eager to preach the gospel of God to you at Rome, then says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. Think of the context in which Paul is saying this. He's writing from Corinth, and he's writing to the church at Rome. Think of this now. Corinth, where everywhere you look, there are, there are pantheon, a pantheon of false gods. There are temple prostitutes. There's uh, wickedness all around. He's writing to the church at Rome, where there's a great army and, and prestigious uh, leadership, and, and uh, where there are idols, and, and where everywhere you look, there's the, the highest uh, forms of the culture. It is the center of culture in the world. And yet Paul is saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The the Roman government, the Greco-Roman government was against the church. Uh, The Jews were against the church. Everybody's against the church. And yet Paul says what? 
I am not ashamed of the gospel. He's not looking to accommodate the culture. He's not looking to adopt cultural language and and to do that, uh, to be like the world, to reach the world. He just simply says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. And so he's not ashamed. He's going forth with confidence and with love and compassion. He's not retreatist. He's going forward with love and with boldness and confidence, not in his own gifts, not in techniques, but in the Lord. Amen? That is the confidence, dear ones, that we need to go forward with. Even as we think of Edwards, as he goes forward into uh, the mission. I wanted to read, before I uh, quote a lot of Edwards, I want to quote uh, Winston Churchill. I've just started reading some post-war speeches by him, and so much of it is uh, really helpful Uh, One thing he wrote I thought was uh, helpful for this gathering is this, quote, this is just after the war had ended, just months after the war had ended. The time for generalities has passed. He's speaking to the House of Commons. The time for generalities has passed, and our difficulties and dangers will not be removed by closing our eyes to them. That peace will not be preserved by pious sentiments expressed in terms of platitudes or by official grimaces and diplomatic correctitude. Brothers, it's not time for platitudes and Presbyterian grimaces and political correctitude. It is time to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ with boldness and confidence and love from all of Scripture and to plant churches and to strengthen churches and to go into all the world to do just that. It's what, it's what Edwards did. It's what our Reformed forefathers did. We need to stop being so afraid of losing what we have, freedom, possessions, comforts, and be more joyful about what it is that we currently have. The Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, all the opportunity in the world before us to reach the world for Christ. What an opportunity we have to go forward. Light in the darkness. Let us go out with this confident attitude. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the midst of our sufferings. We rejoice in God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We do not live in fear. We live by faith and we live rejoicing as the people of God. Well, on a wintry Lord's Day in January 1751, in the frontier village of Stockbridge, Massachusetts, Jonathan Edwards preached one of his earliest sermons as a prospective missionary to the Mohawk and Mohican Indians. His message was on the conversion of Cornelius, the first non-Jew or heathen to become a Christian in Acts chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Edwards made this biblical narrative analogous to a new chapter that was opening in his own life regarding a call to minister to the Native American Indians. The recently dismissed Northampton preacher viewed himself as a part of God's sovereign plan to reach the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Edwards began his sermon on the conversion of Cornelius with a brief description of the history and nature of biblical missions. He informed the Indians that during Christ's public ministry, he, quote, chose 12 men that he might teach, instruct, and fit them to be ministers to preach the gospel. After Christ's resurrection and ascension, and in response to the Great Commission, the 12 disciples, Edward says, quote, went all over the world, and a great many turned to the true God and to the Christian religion. One of those converted was the Gentile Cornelius. Peter preached the gospel to Cornelius' household, and, quote, they all gladly received the word, and it filled them full of joy to hear the good news concerning Jesus Christ, the Savior of men, end quote. 
The disciples then, quote, preached the gospel to others, to others in all parts of the world so that a great many nations turned Christian who before were heathen, end quote. And what may have been there for a dramatic moment in the sermon, Edwards declared to the Indians that were seated before him, quote, Now I am come to preach the true religion to you and to your children, as Peter did to Cornelius and his family, that you and all your children may be saved, end quote. Jonathan Edwards would go on to serve as a missionary pastor to the Mohawk and Mohican or Stockbridge Indians for almost seven years, from 1751 to 1758. This may surprise some of you because Edwards is mostly remembered for his work as a pastor and a theologian and a philosopher and a writer and a Calvinist preacher during the Great Awakening. Nevertheless, despite the lack of scholarly attention that this significant period of Edwards' life has received, this prominent late colonial figure gave the final years of his life to the propagation of the gospel among the Indian nations. More than just a compelling historical account, however, uh, Edward's mission to the Indians serves as a helpful corrective to some of the, the most misguided trends in the contemporary missions movement. While there are noticeable blind spots in Edward's approach to Christian mission, there are also valuable lessons to be learned. My purpose in this message this afternoon, therefore, is threefold. First, to provide a brief historical backdrop to Edward's missionary calling. Second, to furnish an overview of Edward's approach to biblical mission. And third, to consider what the church might learn from Edward's understanding and application of the Great Commission. So let's begin uh, this afternoon by considering the historical context from Northampton to Stockbridge. George Marsden, in his outstanding biography on Edwards, writes that the, quote, scene of America's greatest theologian and colonial America's most powerful thinker being run out of Northampton and forced into exile in a frontier village has intrigued observers ever since, end quote. It is indeed a fascinating story. How could Jonathan Edwards' congregation oust him after such a long and notable ministry? Was Edwards' new calling a forced exile? Or did he desire to serve as a missionary on the edge of the wilderness for the advancement of Christ's kingdom? Edwards was pastor of the Northampton Church from 1729 to 1750. His ministry at Northampton came to a thorny end, however, when it became apparent that his views on church membership and admission to the Lord's Supper, which conflicted with the views of his predecessor and grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, would not be tolerated by the majority of his congregation. Talk about being in a pickle uh, as a minister, going against the well-respected predecessor who is also your uh, grandfather. Edwards uh, was not satisfied with the long-established, quote, Stoddardian standards for church membership and admission to the Lord's Supper, which simply required a person to, quote, possess orthodoxy, moral sincerity, and a lack of scandal. So again, according uh, to, Stoddard, uh, to uh, Solomon Stoddard, if you possessed orthodoxy, moral sincerity, and a lack of scandal, you could come to the table. Edwards' qualification, in addition to these, called for a genuine testimony of experiential and fruit-bearing faith. In other words, according to Edwards, higher standards must be set in place in order to prevent, as much as possible, the unconverted from coming to the Lord's table. Unlike Stoddard, Edwards did not believe that the Lord's Supper was a converting ordinance. Communion is for the regenerate, the, those who profess faith in Christ before the elders and give a pre credible profession. In a letter to his friend, Reverend John Erskine in Scotland, dated May 20th, 1749, Edwards writes the following. I have nothing very comfortable to inform of concerning the present state of religion in this place. 
A very great difficulty has arisen between me and my people relating to qualifications for communion at the Lord's table. My honored grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, my predecessor in the ministry over this church, strenuously maintained the Lord's Supper to be a converting ordinance and urged all to come who were not of scandalous life, though they knew themselves to be unconverted. I formally conformed to this practice, but I have had dared no longer to proceed in the former way, which has occasioned great uneasiness among my people and has filled all the country with noise which has obliged me to write something on the subject, which is now in the press, end quote. The very great difficulty that emerged in Edwards' congregation over conflicting views on the Lord's Supper grew progressively worse until finally, in June of 1750, 207 of 230 male members voted to remove Edwards from his pastorate. Shortly thereafter, on the Lord's Day, July 1st, the prominent New England pastor preached a farewell sermon to his flock after 22 years of faithful ministry. It was a painful time for the Edwards family. Just just let this sink in for a minute. Think of the fact that the Great Awakening was taking place just a few years before this. The Great Revival Times. Northampton being turned upside down, large parts of New England under revival as well as across the pond in England. And just a few years later, we have this congregation ousting its minister who is celebrated around the world. Four days later, in another letter to John Erskine, Edwards referenced the, quote, multitude of distracting troubles and hurries amidst his extraordinary circumstances. Uh, Pastors, have you ever dealt with a multitude of distracting troubles and hurries? If you haven't, then you just started yesterday. (laughs) He said, amidst his extraordinary circumstances and how he is now, as it were, thrown upon the wide ocean of the world and know not what will become of me and my numerous and chargeable family, nor have I any particular door in view that I depend upon to be opened for my future serviceableness. There was no vacant pulpit website to look on. When a minister lost his position after these decades of ministry, it was uh, certainly, as he says, a wide ocean of the world that he was looking upon, not knowing where he would land. Edwards expressed understandable concern that, quote, most places in New England that want a minister would not be forward to invite one with so chargeable a family or large family, nor one so far advanced in years, being 46. (laughs) The fifth day of the last October. Yeah, who's going to want a pastor over 46 years old? Notwithstanding his difficult circumstances, Edwards wrote that his future and his family were, quote, in the hands of God, and I bless him. I am not anxious, he wrote, concerning his disposal of us. I hope I shall not distrust him, nor be unwilling to submit to his will. Dear pastor, perhaps you're in a difficult circumstances in your own congregation. Maybe you are in the midst of trying times. Maybe you are wondering where your next call is going to come from. Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all of your ways and he will make your paths straight. Let us take encouragement from Edwards. The following year, Edwards was not without several new opportunities for pastoral ministry. Possibilities included pastorates in Connecticut, Northampton, yes, a faction of his congregation wanted him to plant a new church. That's never happened before, right? (laughs) He was offered pastorates in Virginia and Scotland, but God called Edwards to Stockbridge in order to serve as a missionary to the Indians and to pastor a small congregation of English colonists in the same village. He didn't take 
the path of least resistance. He didn't take the easy way. He didn't take the comfortable way. He received this call. And he wrote to his friend, the Reverend Thomas Gillespie, and asked to be remembered, quote, at the throne of grace with regard to all my trials and with regard to my new circumstances and the important service I have undertaken in this place. Well, how about Edwards on mission? What do we learn from him about mission? Jonathan Edwards possessed a keen interest in Christian mission from his earliest days as a gospel minister. A commitment to mission is recognizable in his letters, sermons, and personal involvements. In a series of sermons preached in 1739, which were published posthumously in 1774 in Scotland, under the title, A History of the Work of Redemption, many of you will be familiar with that, the Northampton minister carefully explains the providential unfolding of God's saving purposes from the fall of mankind to the end of the world. In this work, Edwards confidently and optimistically refers time and again to the, quote, success of the, quote, pro propagation of the gospel or missions since the ascension of Christ, in spite of the constant barrage of satanic persecution. Satan and the kingdoms of this world seek to undermine and destroy God's redemptive purposes but God's sovereign design and plan cannot be thwarted. This is seen most clearly in the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. So Edwards writes this, quote, Satan before had exalted his throne very high in this world, even to the very stars of heaven, reigning in great glory in his heathen Roman Empire. But never before had he such a downfall as he had soon after Christ's ascension. He had, we may suppose, been very lately triumphing in a supposed victory, having brought about the death of Christ, which he doubtless gloried in as the greatest feat that he ever did, and probably imagined he had totally defeated God's design by him. But he was quickly made sensible that he had only been running excuse me, that he had only been ruining his own kingdom when he saw it tumbling so fast so soon after as a consequence of the death of Christ. For Christ, having ascended and received the Holy Spirit, poured it forth abundantly for the conversion of thousands and millions of souls, end quote. According to Edwards, therefore, the success of the propagation of the gospel and the conversion of millions of souls should be of no surprise. Now listen, since it is, quote, agreeable to what Christ and his apostles foretold, end quote. That is, that Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Light in the darkness, light in the darkness. Christian mission for the famed New England pastor is the, quote, principal moving force in the history of redemption. Those are his words. Please hear this, dear ones. Christian mission for reformed Calvinists, for those who hold to our reformed confession, those are my words, but he would agree with them, is the principal moving force in the history of redemption. That which God uses to triumph over evil, gather and perfect his elect, magnif magnify his triune glory, and restore all things. Clearly, dear ones, mission has a central place in Edwards' theological framework. If we are not busy doing mission in the world, sharing the gospel with our neighbors, taking the gospel to the nations, planting churches, strengthening churches, doing the work of evangelists, pouring our lives out, then we are not of the same ilk as Jonathan Edwards or Calvin or Pierre Verre or so many others that we claim to love and admire and we read their stuff and yet we find ourselves not being as zealous for evangelism and mission as they were. And oh, how we should be. Being reformed and confessional in no way should damper our 
evangelism. Believing in the sovereignty of God and the covenants of redemption and the work of Christ and and God's electing and predestinating grace fuels evangelism and mission. It doesn't dampen it when properly understood. Well, in addition to his understanding of the Bible's teaching on the nature, role, and aim of the missionary task, Edward's relationship with David Brainerd, missionary to the Native American Indians, would have undoubtedly served to shape Edward's view of mission. Brainerd made a deep and profound impression on, on, on Edwards as he spent the final months of his life in Edward's Northampton home in 1747. One would assume that during Brainerd's season of illness, the two ministers would have discussed at length the subject of Christian mission, particularly as it related to his gospel labors among the Indians. After Brainerd died of tuberculosis, Edwards was compelled to temporarily set aside his work on the freedom of the will and produce what would become his most notable publication, an edited version of Brainerd's diary entitled The Life and Diary of the Reverend David Brainerd. Not only was this book meant to encourage readers to emulate Brainerd's godly piety, it was also intended to cultivate a sincere zeal for Christian mission. To quote, this is, these are Edward's words, to quote, encourage God's people to earnest prayers and endeavors for the advancement and enlargement of the kingdom of Christ in the world. Edwards, profoundly impacted by Brainerd's zeal for Christian mission among the Indians, remarked during his funeral that, quote, a little before his death, he said to me, as I came into the room, quote, this is Brainerd, my thoughts have been employed on the old dear theme, the prosperity of God's church on earth. As I waked out of sleep, I was led to cry for the pouring out of God's spirit for the advancement of Christ's kingdom, which the dear Redeemer died and suffered so much for. According to Edwards, Brainerd served as, quote, an excellent example of a missionary who sought the prosperity of Zion with all of his might. End quote. His gospel work with the Native Americans inspired Christians to, quote, pray for the conversion of the Indians on this continent and to exert themselves in the use of proper means for its accomplishment, end quote. And so with theocentric optimism, with theocentric optimism, Edwards hoped that, quote, God's extensive work of grace among the Indians was but a forerunner of something yet much more glorious and extensive of that kind. Moreover, he hoped that it would motivate Christians to, quote, honor the Lord with their substance by contributing as they are able to promote the spreading of the gospel among the Indians. Edwards' hopes for the life and diary of David Brainerd were more than realized. The book has proved to be one of the most influential volumes on Christian mission in the last 250 years. How many of you have read this book? Raise your hand. Okay, the rest of you need to repent (laughs) and go buy this book and read it. It is a treasury of piety, and it is fuel for mission. It has deeply impacted thousands of missionaries and and, uh, and future missionaries, even notables such as William Carey, Henry Martin, Adnerium Judson, and Jim Elliot. It is evident then that Edwards was a pastor theologian with a heart for Christian mission. Sometimes we think that there's some big dichotomy. If you're, if you're serious about doctrine and the study of theology and someone who loves books and, and can't get enough of them, Uh, That you really can't be the man on fire who's sharing the gospel with friends and neighbors and and people you're sitting with on the airplane and and, and family members and and proclaiming the gospel uh, in your church and and to friends of friends and being that evangelist that that Paul uh, exhorts Timothy to be and for all of us to be in one way or another, to be those witnesses No, those two things, if we understand doctrine properly, that doctrine fuels and encourages us to be witnesses, to be light in the darkness. Amen? To be light in the darkness. 
If we don't understand it like that, we don't understand it properly. We are called to be light, not retreat us. We are to go forward with confidence and with love, even as Paul did in Corinth, even as Paul exhorted the Romans to do in Rome. These cultures were way farther gone than anything we're experiencing now, and yet they went forward with such confidence and love and compassion and boldness and zeal, rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God and the, the return of Christ and, 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 and rejoicing in the gospel of God and rejoicing in their sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance character and character hope and hope that does not put to shame because we've been reconciled to God. Edwards was a pastor theologian with a heart for Christian mission. This shaped his theological system and ignited his heart for the lost. Therefore, it should not surprise us that the famed New England preacher passed up the comforts of a city pastorate for the hardships of missionary life on the edge of the wilderness. Edwards was devoted to making disciples of all nations. What are some lessons we learn for today, it's hard to compare Edwards' mid 18th century colonial context to our own, of course, not least as it relates to Christian mission. The world was a very different place back then. Life was much simpler, and myriad approaches to mission and church planting did not exist then as they do uh, today. For example, uh, missionalism and seeker friendly approaches. E the emergent approach to mission, incarnational mission, online mission, live stream mission, metaverse churches we're hearing about now. You've heard about these, haven't you? I was in the airport uh, recently, and I was, uh, I admit it, I confess, I was eavesdropping on the people next to me. Um, I, I, they were right next to me. Sometimes, you know, you're all sitting pretty close. So I, I was listening to these couple talk about the metaverse. So weird. So weird. You, you, literally, people are buying real estate in the metaverse and setting up companies. And so you can put on the goggles, which if I ever put those on, just throw me over the Cooper River Bridge <laughs> and wave goodbye and say, John is done. God bless him, he's done. But you put the goggles on and you enter this completely different world. And so you can literally walk into stores and, and everything is there just as if you were there. And you're picking out things and you're putting it in your, your box and you're paying for it. You take the goggles off, you're still in your living room. And what's in, what is insidious about this is that they're inviting churches to come and to be a part of the metaverse. It's the next big thing. In fact, one of the biggest churches in America has purchased all kinds of real estate, and is already setting their church up. So that you make yourself into an avatar, you know, with like a Yoda head or a zebra head, and you walk in and you sit down next to someone who looks just as weird as you do because they've created themselves in this weird way, and up front is the pastor, the actual pastor in the metaverse. And he's up there, he's preaching, he's asking for money, he's, he's, he's doing all of that. And you're sitting around all these people. You don't really know who they are. And this is the new Christian fellowship and communion with God and with one another. And it must be rejected. We must never stop meeting together. Amen. We are the church gathered. Not the church who is always scattered. I'm getting into my message for tomorrow. I'm sorry. So, so Edwards' mission is, is a long time ago, and at the risk of being a bit anachronistic, it is important to point out that Edwards' theology and practice of mission, in it we discover important and timeless biblical principles that apply to every generation and every cultural setting, including our own. The first thing that Edwards was devoted to was gospel proclamation. Gospel proclamation. Christ's mandate for making disciples through the proclamation of the whole counsel of God 
was Edwards' first priority and mission. The proclamation of the gospel through the whole counsel of God. I think Jesus said something about this in the Great Commission. Teach all that I commanded you. Sounds like an expository preaching ministry. Where the gospel is clearly preached from all of the Bible. This priority of mission should be ours as well. The divinely ordained message, means, and aims of the gospel were never minimized in order to accommodate the unique characteristics of Mohican culture. Edwards was sensitive to his ministry context without over-contextualizing. His confidence was not grounded in his understanding of or identification with Indian culture. The way they dressed, the music they listened to, the language or art. Rather, his confidence was in the bold and faithful proclamation of the word of God, that which God promised to bless for the salvation of the elect from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and culture. Romans 10, 14 through 17, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 2, 5, 1 Peter 1, 23 through 2, 3. What is contextualization? Mike Horton helpfully states, quote, Contextualization is a popular term in Christian circles today. Basically, contextualization is the attempt to situate particular beliefs and practices in their cultural moment. In their cultural, excuse me, in their cultural environment. The attempt to situate particular beliefs and practices in their cultural environment migrating from the rarefied confines of secular sociology to missiological theory and then to practical theology departments and ministry programs, the imperative to contextualize the gospel has become something of a mantra among pastors, youth ministers, and evangelists. Calling the Westminster Shorter Catechism an excellent system of divinity, Edwards approved of its teaching that the, quote, spirit of God maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and of building them up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. The efficacious nature of the gospel, of gospel preaching, was just as true for the American Indians as it was for the British colonists. It is just as true for us. God, in his divine wisdom, has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save his elect in every age and in every culture. And as it concerns contextualization, could it not be said that this is one of our biggest problems today? It's taking place in the mission of the church today. The idea that we have to sound like the world and to adopt the language of the world and even to give in and capitulate to some of the values of the world in order to win the world. Where do we see that in the Bible? It's just not there. Nowhere in Scripture do we see the apostles saying in order to get the ear of the culture, we must tailor the message in such a way that gives in to some of their assumptions and adopts some of their compromising language as it concerns, let's say, human sexuality or perhaps social justice in order to have the ear of the culture. Because if we don't do that, if we don't adopt some of their language and, and some of their values and, and some of the things in, in sociology and, and psychology, and, and we sort of have to mix all this together so that we will keep the ear of the culture. Because if we do not, we will lose the younger generation. And so we have a mission that's filled with cultural accommodation. We have a mission that has adopted the values and the language of the world. We have a mission that's, that's, that where the confidence is no longer in the covenant of redemption and in the covenant of grace clearly set forth in Genesis 12, 15, and 17. 
And the one that Christ came to fulfill when he said, Father, I have come to save these, those whom you have given me, and of those I will not lose one. And of Paul and the apostles who say, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, where that revealed righteousness of God in Christ is applied to the elect, and they are drawn to the Lord, and they are doing this with confidence. And not saying, okay, how, how much can we be like the world so they'll listen to us? You will just not find that in Scripture. In fact, what you find are people, one minute worshiping Paul and the others because they've performed a miracle, and the next minute they want to kill them because of their preaching. One minute, our Lord Jesus Christ is being praised, hearing the hallelujahs, and the next minute they're crying, crucify him. Who ever said that the mission of the church would include becoming like the world to reach the world. Edward certainly did not believe this. Notwithstanding the preeminence of biblical preaching, however, Edwards was far from insensitive to his surroundings. In fact, he took pains to make the ministry of God's word accessible to the Indians and to facilitate the provision of their basic temporal needs. Edwards' preaching to the Indians is a stellar example of of contextualization without compromise. He knew his context. One Edward scholar explains that, quote, it is clear from the extant manuscripts that Edwards worked hard to adapt his rhetoric to the limited capacity of his hearers, end quote. A fellow missionary familiar with Edwards' preaching ministry to the Indians wrote in a letter that, quote, to the Indians, Edwards was a plain and practical preacher. Upon no occasion did he display any metaphysical knowledge in the pulpit. His sentences were concise and full of meaning, and his delivery grave and natural. End quote. While tailoring his sermons to better accommodate the Indians uh, through his highly valued interpreter, Edwards clearly retained his deep and abiding commitment to the bold proclamation of the word of God, and during his tenure in Stockbridge, rather than simply preach old sermons, he carefully prepared and preached over 200 original sermons to the Indians. He loved them. He cared for them. He labored. And he knew that his context was not the same as it was in Northampton. But he still preached the gospel to them clearly and boldly and courageously. One example of Edwards' accessible preaching is found in an early sermon to the Indians entitled Heaven's Dragnet from Matthew 13, 47 through 15. It is likely that Edwards chose to preach on this passage uh, earlier on in his uh, ministry in Stockbridge uh, in an attempt to engage the hunter-gatherer culture of the Indians. In this parable uh, is found the simple message explaining the sobering truth, the sobering truth that every person, rich or poor, white or brown, is either a member of the kingdom of heaven or a member of the kingdom of hell. According to Edwards, quote, the people of Christ are separated from the rest of the world to be a peculiar people to him, to be Christ's part. As the net cast into the sea separates the fish that are in it from all the rest in the sea, and that they may belong to the fishermen and be his part of the fish of the sea, while the rest are let alone and not meddled with, end quote. On the last day when Christ returns, the wicked will be, in the words of Edwards, severed from among the just and shall be cast into a furnace of fire. After the day of judgment, not only will the souls of men be punished, but their bodies, which shall be raised from the dead, shall be thrown into eternal fire, end quote. However, for Christians, Edwards writes, the country they are to live in forever with Christ their king is heaven, end quote. In light of this truth, the New England preacher exhorts his Indian hearers to, quote, take heed to yourselves that you be not found at last among the bad fish that be cast away. See to it that your hearts 
are right with God. In preparation for the Lord's Supper in August of 1751, Edwards preached a brief sermon to the Indians from Psalm 1 and verse 3. Quote, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Having been raised near the banks of the Connecticut River, this rich imagery was meaningful to Edwards and to his Indian congregation. He explained to the Mohicans that, quote, Christ is to the heart of a true saint like a river to the roots of a tree that is planted by it. Then, in a profoundly pastoral and lucid manner, Edwards outlines the way in which Christ is a river of life to his redeemed people. Through his faithful interpreter, Edwards provides five simple but profoundly meaningful points to prepare his Indian congregation for communion. By the way, you're hearing the refrain of things being simple and plain. And if you've ever preached in a foreign land, perhaps... Like me, you've been up to the Andes Mountains in Peru, and you've preached with a Quechua interpreter. I know a lot of folks do mission in Peru uh, from, the, from the southeast. And, uh, man, it's laborsome. It's laborsome. I'm like, hi, my name is Pastor John. And then he speaks for like three minutes. <laughs> like, what in the world is he talking about? Every word is like 24 letters long, right? And so there's that, that, that labor of... of of keeping things simple and straightforward. Well, in preparation for the Lord's Supper, Edwards provides five simple but profoundly meaningful points to prepare his congregation. First one is this. These are Edwards' words. Quote, As the waters of a river run easily and freely, so the love of Christ. He freely came into the world. He laid down his life and endured those dreadful sufferings. His blood was freely shed. Blood flowed as freely from his wounds as water from a spring. Secondly, Christ is like a river in the great plenty and abundance of his love and grace. The love of Christ is great, and he has done great things from love. The good things that are the fruits of his love are infinitely great. The happiness that he gives is worth more than all the silver and gold in the world. Number three, waters of a river don't fail. It flows constantly and continually, day and night. Little brooks dry up in a very dry time, but the waters of a great river continue running. Continue running continually and from one age to another and are never dry. So Christ never leaves his saints that love him and trust in him. The love of Christ never ceases. Fourthly, a tree planted by a river is never dry. So Christ is never exhausted. The soul of a saint is joined to Christ and they are made one. As the water enters into the roots of the tree, so Christ enters the heart and soul of a godly man and dwells there. Fifthly and finally, water refreshes. So Christ refreshes and satisfies the heart and makes us rejoice. Waters gives life and keeps it alive. So Christ enlivens the heart and makes it grow makes it grow beautiful and fruitful, end quote. Edwards' missionary preaching, therefore, took on, quote, a renewed simplicity in both form and substance. He took into account his con- cultural context and accommodated the limited capacity of his hearers, all without, all, now here's the key, all without diminishing or setting aside the clear message of Scripture or the divinely appointed method of its delivery. The word and sacraments, the word and sacraments, God's means of grace, were central to Edward's ministry in Stockbridge. If this were only true of all modern Reformed church planters and missionaries. For we live in a day when, as one author writes, quote, proper sensitivity to, to diverse cultural contexts 
is sometimes turned into an ideology that leads to distortions of or distortions from the gospel. End quote. In an effort to reach the lost, many churches expend a significant portion of their energy, time, wit, and resources on attempting to understand and incorporate the world's cultural fads and trends into their worship and programs rather than seeking to be faithful in the ordinary ways that God has promised to gather and to perfect his elect. Pastor, is it really that simple? Yes, it really is that simple. Do you need to know your context? Of course you do. Do you need to understand who is in front of you? Of course you do. Do you need to compromise the message in any way, shape, or form? Of course not. We preach Christ and him crucified. We preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. We do not hold these things back. We declare them boldly and courageously and with love and compassion and tears in our eyes. Because we glory in our Savior and we want him to be high and lifted up. And we know that when he is high and lifted up, he will draw all of his own unto himself. Whether in first century Ephesus, 18th century Stockbridge, or 21st century Greenville, or New York City, or wherever you may be from, the ordinary means of word, sacraments, and prayer are God's ordained tools for making disciples and building his church. Our Lord said so, Matthew 28, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. How do you know the means of grace will work? How do you know they are efficacious? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Christ said it, and he will do it. Go, therefore, knowing that we go in the authority of Christ and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Two glorious promises bookending this exhortation, this imperative to go forth and make disciples through the means of grace. What did the early church do immediately after Pentecost? Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Definite articles before each of these elements of worship. This is public worship. This is what they were devoted to, the means of grace. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and following. For the word of the cross, this is, this is a letter to the Corinthian church. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the what? The power of God. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Paul writes. Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, through sociology, through psychology, through cultural accommodation, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, and the culture demands capitulation. But we preach Christ, crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, are you making the connections? Paul was not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God. The power of God is Christ. 
For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to your worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Why is it that God has chosen the foolish means of preaching and water and bread and wine to be that which draws the elect and nourishes the elect and, and, and nourishes the elect all the way home so that he gets the glory and so that we can't boast in what it is that we are doing, but only in what God is doing through these ordinary, unadorned, unimpressive means of grace. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, what? Boast in the Lord. And when I came to you, brothers, I didn't come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit, here's that word again, and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men or in sociology, psychology, or whatever else, but in the power of God. Of course, it's not the means themselves that Edwards put his confidence in, but the power of God in and through them. Unless the Lord builds the house, even with his ordained tools, we labor in vain. In his A History of the Work of Redemption, Edwards comments on the impressive and unlikely propagation of the gospel in the early church, considering the, quote, powerful opposition of the Roman government. What cause can explain the spread of the gospel in such hostile conditions, Edwards wondered. According to Edwards, the, quote, Roman Empire had subdued many mighty and potent kingdoms. They subdued the Grecian monarchy, though it made the utmost resistance, and they could not conquer the church which was in their hands. Edwards continues. This is one of the brightest points in Edwards on mission. And may it give you confidence, dear pastor, dear elder, dear church member, may it give you confidence. Here's Edwards. No other sufficient cause can possibly be assigned for this propagation of the gospel, but only God's own power. It was not the outward strength of the instruments which were employed in it. At first, the gospel was preached by only a few fishermen who were without power and worldly interest to support them. It was not their craft and policy that produced this wonderful effect, for they were poor, illiterate men. It was not the agreeableness of the story they had to tell the nation to the notions and principles of mankind. This was no pleasant fable. A crucified God and Savior was to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. It was not the agreeableness of their doctrines to the dispositions of men, for nothing is more contrary to the corruptions of men than the pure doctrines of the gospel. This effect, therefore, can have proceeded from no other cause than the power of an agency of God. And if the power of God was thus exercised to cause the gospel to prevail, then the gospel is his word. For surely God does not use his almighty power to promote a mere imposter and delusion. End quote. Dear friends, please hear this. The mission of the, of the church and the means of its accomplishment have not changed since Christ instituted them. They have not changed. And whatever is taking place in our day, in our culture, and as the, uh, the darkness gets da darker, we do not change our, our mission, which comes from our Lord. We do not change our message, which comes from the Lord. And we do not change our ministry, which comes from the Lord. Unlike some today who are choosing cultural relevance and accommodation over biblical fidelity, Edwards was firmly committed to that, which God promised would be efficacious 
in the lives of his elect. David Wells is right when he states that the, quote, biblical word is self-authenticating under the power of the Holy Spirit. This word of God is the means by which God accomplishes his saving work in his people. And this is a work that no evangelism, excuse me, that no evangelist and no preacher can do. He goes on to write, this is why the dearth of serious, sustained biblical preaching in the church today is a serious matter. When the church loses the word of God, it loses the very means by which God does his work. In its absence, therefore, a script is being written, however unwittingly, for the church's undoing. Not in one cataclysmic moment, but in a slow, inexorable slide made up of peace, made up of piece by piece by tiny, excuse me, made up of piece by tiny piece of daily dereliction. But in a slow, inexorable slide made up of piece by tiny piece of daily dereliction, end quote. The devil does his best when he is deceiving the church into slow, incremental change as it concerns the mission and message and ministry of the church. Edward's commitment to the means of grace while serving as a missionary on the frontier is a tremendous encouragement to missionaries and church planters everywhere. While he certainly made right accommodation for the Indians in his preaching, remembering the frontier context in which he labored, he never negotiated the centrality of the word. He believed God's sure promise that the gospel preached from all of Scripture is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. Due to time, I will not elaborate on Edwards's, on Edwards's love for the Indians and his care and his writing back to supporters to send various uh, uh, needs for the Indians in terms of clothing and, and other kinds of and medications. And he was always serving them and loving them in this way. His mission was not devoid of diaconal service and encouragement and love. And so Edwards had a wonderful balance in his ministry of, of proclaiming the whole counsel of God, proclaiming the gospel, uh, carrying out word and sacrament ministry while also seeing diaconal work done in the midst. Well, the pattern that we see in Edwards' ministry to the Stockbridge in Indians is an example for missionary pastors today. Firstly, supreme attention is given to the ministry of the word. Edwards' confidence does not reside in his own abilities or innovative outreach techniques, but in the life-giving word. Making disciples through the regular preaching and teaching of all that Christ commanded was his unmistakable priority. The Stockbridge Indians' greatest need was deliverance from Satan, sin, and e eternal damnation. As with Christ and the apostles, Edwards understood his and the church's primary calling and purpose to be the proclamation of the gospel, which is the power of God of sal to salvation to everyone who believes. Secondly, Edwards' approach to missions was chiefly informed and fueled by biblical theology, not by cultural and pragmatic considerations. His first question was not, what does the culture require or what will the people think, but rather, what does the Bible say? Edwards believed that man is essentially the same in every age, depraved, and rebellious sinners, and thus have the same essential need, God's grace and forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ. Whether one is preaching to first century Greeks or 18th century American Indians or 21st century North Americans in the urban context, the root problem and ultimate need are the same. Young preacher, seminary student, please remember this. May it ring in your ears as you go into ministry. The ultimate problem and the ultimate solution are the same today as they always have been since the fall of mankind. In his A History of the Work of Redemption, Edwards eloquently elucidates the grand narrative of God's unfolding plan of redemption, a sovereign and gracious plan to apply the accomplished work of Christ to the elect in every age and every nation. While circumstances and culture changes, the message and means of the gospel do not. He says this, quote, The work of redemption is carried on in all ages, from the fall of man to the end of the world. 
The work of God in converting souls, opening blind eyes, unstopping deaf ears, raising dead souls to life, and rescuing the miserable captives out of the hands of Satan was begun soon after the fall of man, had been carried on in the world ever since to this day, and will be to the end of the world. God has always had such a church in the world, though oftentimes it has been reduced to a very narrow compass and to low circumstances, yet it has never wholly failed, end quote. The destruction of Satan's kingdom, he says, will not be accomplished all at once, however, as by some great miracle like the resurrection of the dead. No, Edwards clearly states that, quote, this work will be accomplished by means, by the preaching of the gospel and the use of the ordinary means of grace, and so shall gradually be brought to pass. Therefore, The strategy of churches and mission agencies to reach the nations by sending and supporting Christian artists and musicians and baristas and athletes to redeem culture and do life with their community for the sake of the gospel may be well-intentioned, but it is foreign to Scripture and to the Great Commission. In our zeal to be relevant and to identify with unbelievers, we too often exchange God's mission strategy for our own. Well-meaning Christians who head to the mission field to carry out their sundry vocations, often at a high price to the church, may fulfill the great commandment by doing so, namely loving your neighbor, but not by definition the great commission, which is to preach the gospel, to baptize, to plant churches, to strengthen churches, and to administer communion and to disciple. That is the call. That's the missionary task. And if our missionary agencies are so flush with those who are not doing those things, we must ask why. The church must renew its commitment to identify, call, and support qualified, trained, gifted, and ordained men to plant and strengthen churches at home and abroad. Few remember... Jonathan Edwards for his role as a Christian missionary pastor to the Stockbridge Indians in colonial Massachusetts. Even so, his legacy, his legacy, both theological and practical, encourages the church to re-examine her priorities, methods, and strategies, and calls us, dear ones, to recover the biblical foundations of Christian mission, light in the darkness. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for these few moments to consider Christian mission, even as we consider a great father in the faith upon whose shoulders we stand upon. Theologically, as many of us have understood, but even as we consider Christian mission, may we go forth with confidence to our neighbors and to our communities and to the nations even as Edwards did to the Mohawk and Mohican Indians in 1751. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.